Well, the, the theme for uh, the conference is Do Not Disturb. And my title for, for this study this morning is Jesus, Not Distractions. In other words, don't let the cares of this world distract you from having a relationship with Jesus. I'm going to give you an example of this. The parable of the sower. There are four different kinds of soil. You had the wayside, the stony ground, the thorns, uh, the ground with thorns, and then the good ground. But I want to talk about, just real quick here briefly, the ground with thorns. So if you would, turn, with your, turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. Verse 7, Mark 4, 7. And it reads like this. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and, yield, and it yielded no crop. You see, the seed was able to grow, but once the thorns grew up as well, it came and choked the crop so that the crop could not grow. But notice the explanation of the parable in verse 18. Mark 4, 18 and 19. Now these are the ones sown among thorns. They are the ones who hear the word and the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires for other things entering in choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. There are three things that cause distractions, three things that will choke the word of God. But notice what's mentioned first, cares. And I bring that up because the, the word care there in the Greek is marimna, and it means cares, but check this out, it also means anxiety. Notice what thorns can do to plants. Thorns block sunlight, suffocate plants by wrapping its branches around it, takes up all the oxygen, and sucks up all the moisture. But notice what anxiety can do to the heart. Unbelief. Unbelief blocks the truth of God's word. Sin. Sin suffocates growth. And anxiety will suck up our time, energy, and focus for Jesus Christ. We need Jesus, not distractions. This morning, I'm going to cover three areas that can cause us to be distracted from growing in our relationship with Jesus. Number one, and you would think, okay, well, you know, drugs or whatever. Number one, our upbringing. Number two, a previous sin or lifestyle. And number three are failures. Those can all become distractions and keep us or hinder us from growing in our relationship with Jesus Christ. But before I, before I dive into this, I want, I want to ask the Lord to prepare our hearts for the study of his word. So let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity uh, for this event, for this conference. Thank you, Lord, that... Uh, the theme is do not disturb, and, and, and there's so many distractions in our world today. And Lord, you put these three on my heart, heavy on my heart, Lord. Our upbringing, yeah, a previous sin or lifestyle, and our failures. I know they've caused distractions tremendous, tremendously in my life, Lord. And I pray that you would move me aside, Heavenly Father. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that it would be you speaking through me, and that you would minister to the youth, to, to the young adults that are here, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Our first distraction, our upbringing. Our example is Jephthah, the judge. Let's turn to Judges chapter 11. Judges chapter 11, we'll start at verses 1 and 2.
Give you a couple of seconds to get there. I want to read this together. <clears throat> Now Jephthah, the Gileadite, was a mighty man of valor, but he was a son of a harlot. And Gilead, his dad, begot Jephthah. Gilead's wife bore sons. And when his wife's sons grew up, they drove Jephthah out and said to him, You shall have no inheritance in our father's house, for you are the son of another woman. Notice that Jephthah is a mighty man of valor. But his upbringing wasn't very kind to him. His mother was a prostitute. He was born out of wedlock. He was half Canaanite, half Jewish. And his brothers kicked him out of his family. Talk about an up, a rough upbringing. But notice how this affected Jephthah. Verse 3, Then Jephthah fled from his brothers and dwelt in the land of Tob. And worthless men banded together with Jephthah, and went out raiding with him. Now the word worthless there, this word means ethically worthless. In other words, what these men thought were right in their mind and what they thought was wrong in their mind was worthless. And you think about our world today and how some people think, think some things are right and some things are wrong and it's, it's just worthless. Jephthah's upbringing caused him to be discouraged, to make bad choices, and no doubt he was bitter and angry. You know, my parents, uh, growing up, they were not saved. Uh, there was myself and two other siblings, and they did the best they could to raise us. But I experienced a lot of bad things that, um, that made me bitter, that made me angry. It caused anxiety. And like Jephthah, I found myself making a lot, a lot of bad choices in my life. John 10.10 10 says, The thief does not come except to steal, kill, and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. You see, Satan's plan is to steal our innocence, kill our hope, and to destroy our lives. And he does that when we're young. You see, if Satan can get us when we're young with the trauma, then we have to grow up with this trauma and we have to deal with it. And if we don't have the Lord Jesus Christ, I don't know how a person does it. We've all had some certain traumas in our life, and maybe you haven't, praise the Lord. But some of us have had some certain traumas, and without the Lord, I don't know how I would have made it, because I've made a lot of bad choices, and I blame that on those traumas. I, but I can't blame my parents for, for the choices that I made. Yeah, it stirred me up and it got me angry. But I'm the one that had to be responsible for my own actions and my own sin. But Satan wants to get us in our upbringing. And I want to encourage you that we need the Lord Jesus Christ. We need Jesus, not distractions. I, still with, I, I, I deal with insecurity at times, sometimes anxiety, uh, sometimes anger, but I thank the Lord Jesus Christ that they don't have control over me anymore. They flare up a little bit here and there, but they don't have control over my life like they used to, and I thank the Lord for that. Now let's read on here, verses 4 through 11. And it came to pass after a time that people, the people of Ammon made war against Israel. And so it was when the people of Ammon made war against Israel that the elders of Gilead went to Jephthah from the land of Tob. And they said to Jephthah, Come and be our commander, that we may fight against the people of Ammon. So the commander, so Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, Did you not hate me and expel me from my father's house? Why have you come to me now in, in your distress? Verse 8. And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, That is why we have turned again to you now that you may go with us and fight against the people of Ammon and be our head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. So Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, if you take me back home to fight against the people of Ammon and the Lord delivers them to me, shall I be your head? In other words, will I be your leader? Verse 10, and the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, the Lord will be a witness between us 
if we do not do according to your words. Then Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him head and commander over them. And Jephthah spoke all his words before the Lord in Mizpah. Despite Jephthah's upbringing and his current reputation, I want to call him a gangster because he's over there with these, these band of guys raiding people. In spite of all that, his brother still wanted him to be the leader of his family. Wow. You see, God wasn't done with Jephthah. His family thought they were done with Jephthah, but God was just getting started. God turned Jephthah's upbringing and bad choices into learning opportunities to be a great leader for God. I call it training ground. You see, whatever we go through in life, it's training ground. Don't ever despise those things. Yeah, they're not fun to go through. Yeah, they're, they're, they're horrible and they, and they cause anxiety and all that. But know this, if you're in Christ, God is going to use that in your life. And if you allow him to, he will grow you and mature you to be that leader that God wants you to be. Don't give the enemy the foothold to say, you know what, I don't care. Because I used to live like that. Before I became a Christian, it's like, oh, what's the use? I'm just going to go get high. What's the use? I'm going to go get drunk. And it doesn't matter anyways. No. God wants to use those areas in your life for training ground. Christian, Pastor Christian was mentioning, um, he was in, in, in our youth group, and I remember when he graduated, he wanted to be in the ministry so bad. I'm like, and we would meet for coffee, and I would tell him, you know what, hey, bro, you just got to trust God. And he went almost all over the world. He went to, he went to Hawaii. He went to Marietta. He went to uh, Cambodia. He went to Virginia, you know, and he'd come back, and we'd meet and have coffee, and he'd say, hey, a lot of my friends are getting married. I'd like to be married. I'd like, bro, just trust the Lord and wait on the Lord. I said, all of this is training ground, Christian. And look at him now. He's married got a lovely wife. He's one of our pastors here. All those experiences that he went through was training ground. What can we take away from Jephthah's life? Don't allow hurtful or negative upbringings to cause you to live in fear and bondage to the past. Fear and bondage are distractions. I have a verse for you. Philippians 3, 13 through 14. I'm reading this in the New Living Translation because it gives it a, a little bit more of substance here. It says, No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. If you're being distracted by your past, then it's time to reach out. Maybe it's a time to, to set up that appointment with this pa a pastor. Maybe it's time to reach out to someone that's older than you and ask them, would you disciple me? Maybe it's just time you need to let go. Distraction number two, a previous sin or lifestyle. And our example for that is the woman caught in adultery. So if you would, let's turn to John chapter 8. John chapter 8, we're going to start in verse 2. The Feast of Tabernacles had just finished. Uh, his brothers were giving him a hard time. Uh, some of the Jews started to believe in him. The Pharisees were getting, the religious leaders were starting to get stirred up because they saw some of the people being transformed and believing in Jesus. So it's right around this time in John chapter 8, verse 2. Now early in the morning he came again into the temple. And all the people came to him. And he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in, in adultery in the very act. 
Verse 5. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. Now, Jesus is in the temple. He's teaching God's word. He's got an audience around him. The scribes and the Pharisees, the religious leader, and who knows that these guys are spying out this one particular woman and this guy, but they catch her in the very act, and then they bring her in front of, I want you to see the setting here, they bring her in front of Jesus and in front of all the people that are listening to the Bible study. Now, first of all, how do you think this woman felt? She was probably half naked, or if not completely naked. No doubt she feels ashamed, frightened, hopeless, and definitely not in control of the situation. I would think she hit rock bottom. Now, here's the sad part. The Sadducees and scribes, they weren't really there for true justice. Because if they were, why didn't they bring the man? He was involved in this as well. They were trying to find a way to accuse Jesus of contradicting the law of Moses. If Jesus would let the the women go free, he would be opposing the law. And if he said to go ahead and condemn her, then they would run to the Romans and say, hey, you know, you have an enemy because he wants to kill this woman. But Jesus stoops down and ignores them and begins to write on the ground. Now, we don't know what he's writing. There's a lot of different commentaries say a lot of different things on what he was writing. But I have an interesting verse for you. If you want to take this down, and I'm going to read it. Jeremiah 17, 13. You might know this. Jeremiah 17, 13 says, O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be ashamed. Those who depart from me shall be written in the earth, because they have forsaken the Lord the fountain of living waters. What is he writing? I don't know. Maybe he's writing their names. Maybe he's writing their names and the sin that they've committed. I don't know. Notice how Jesus responds to the accusers. Verses 7 and 8. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw the throw a stone at her first. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest even to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. They all started to leave one by one from the oldest to the youngest. They were convicted because they were all guilty of some kind of sin. Here's the thing. They had never been caught, though, like this woman. So think about it. you got a rock in your hand. You're ready to throw it. And then Jesus says, hey, if you're without sin, throw the first stone. And that conviction in your heart, you're like, yeah, I'm just as convicted as her. I've just never been caught. So you never want to go in life sinning and sinning, thinking you're not going to get caught, because one day it's going to rise to the surface, and it's not going to be pretty. It's better just to get it out and deal with it now, because once it comes and it's exposed, we're going to be like this woman, stripped, feeling ashamed, feeling hopeless, not in control of the situation. You see, in life, we're, we're in control of the situation. We're sinning, we're in control of the situation. But bam, when Jesus says, okay, time's up, you're not in control anymore. And for these guys, these scribes and Pharisees, it was hard for them to extend grace and mercy because they were living under religion and legalism. And it's hard to extend mercy when you're living under that kind of bondage. Also, it's very difficult 
to extend mercy and grace to someone when you've never experienced God's mercy and grace. When you have experienced mercy and grace from the Lord Jesus Christ, it's so easy to extend. And when you haven't experienced that, we can become self-righteous. We can have our nose up in the air. We can look at people and look down at them because we haven't been in that situation. We always want to extend God's grace and mercy. Why? Because he's extended it to us. And notice how he responds to the woman in verses 10 through 12. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. The word condemned and condemn is the same word, and it means to judge worthy of punishment. But Jesus doesn't condemn her. He tells her, go and sin no more. Now, I wanted to bring up this word sin here. It's harmatano. It means to miss the mark. It's an imperative. In other words, it's not a suggestion. It's a command. So Jesus is telling her, hey, I'm I'm commanding you to don't sin no more. But here's an interesting thing that I pulled out of this. The word sin is not plural. It's singular. Woman, I forgive you. And don't commit adultery anymore. Go. Don't commit that particular sin that has kept you in bondage. Don't commit that sin anymore. Go. And a lot of times the Lord is telling us, get rid of that sin, get rid of that sin. And we're just like, oh, you know what? Oh, it's too hard. Oh, of course it's too hard. That's why we need Jesus. That's why we need a brother or a sister. Someone you can confide in. Someone you can trust. And so you can tag team this and, and be accountable. But here's the thing, if if you can't be accountable to the Holy Spirit, how are you going to be accountable to a person? I remember, I came from a life of drugs and and all that, and I got saved in 1983, and I fell, I fell away, I backslid for five years, fell back into drugs, and in 1989, January 1st, I remember partying, and I'm like, I'm tired. I'm tired. Went to sleep January 2nd. I got up, and I told the Lord, I'm tired. I want to repent. I can't live like this no more. Uh, Dwindled down to, I I don't know, 140 pounds. I've lost my family, my friends. I almost lost my job. And I got on my knees and asked the Lord to forgive me. Got up, went to church that night. That was a Tuesday. Went to church Wednesday, and I never looked back. During that year, closer to the end of that year that, that, that I came back, the Lord told me, the Holy Spirit specifically told me in my heart, Leonard, if you ever go back to drugs, that's how you're going to die. You see, when I got back into drugs, it was so bad that I started getting convulsions. I was up two or three days, and by the third day, my body would just go into convulsion. And I was killing myself. And the Lord told me, if you ever go back to your drugs, that's how you'll die. And that scared me so much because I knew it was the Holy Spirit speaking to my heart. I haven't touched the substance and I don't even care to touch it because I knew that the Lord, the Holy Spirit specifically, was talking to me in my heart. And I didn't want to play games with God in that area. I'm like, oh, let's give it one more try. No, no. How can, what can we take away from the woman caught in adultery? Don't allow a previous sin or lifestyle define who you are. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. As believers, we have a new identity, and it's in Christ. If we don't let go of the past... It can be a distraction in our life. 
You see, the enemy wants to sidetrack you and forget and wants you to forget your new, your new identity. You see, the person I was years ago is not who I am today. Who I am today, my identity is in Christ. I used to have a funny little saying when I was in the high school, uh, when I was a high school pastor. And, and you know how it is, you know, being in high school. I never was in, high, uh, uh, in youth group when I was growing up. But, you know, everybody's trying to, you know, look nice and stuff like that. I said, hey, guys, you got to remember who you are. Your identity is in Christ. Not in your dress, not in the movie stars, or not anybody else. I said, you know how I know that? I said, because I'm bald. I ain't got any hair. But I don't care. Because my identity is in Christ. It doesn't matter how I look. I know who I am in Christ. And I'm secure in that. I'm secure in that. Distraction number three. Our failures. Our example for this is Peter. Let's turn to Matthew 26. Matthew 26, we're going to start at verse 31. And the back, the setting here is Jesus just had uh, Passover with the disciples, the apostles. And then he institutes the Lord's Supper. He has communion with them. And so right after that, this is the setting here, and uh, give you a couple of seconds to get there, Matthew 26, verse 31, and it says, then Jesus said to them, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night, for it is written, and he's quoting Zechariah 13, 7, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Verse 32, but after I have, I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Verse 33, Peter answered and said to him, even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. Jesus said to him, assuredly I say to you that this night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. He, he stirred up all the others to say, yeah, we're with you, bro. We're, not, we're, we're down. We're down for the Lord. We're going to die with you, Lord. The word stumble here is used three times in these verses. And it means a stumbling block which causes someone to trip or fall. And here it carries the idea of offending. In other words, that the disciples... We're going to be offended because of Jesus. Why were they going to be offended because of Jesus? Because the heat was going to be on them. They were going to be persecuted. And they were going to be offended because of that. And they were going to scatter. I love the passion that Peter has for Jesus. You, you got to love it. But passion, listen to this, but passion should always line up with Jesus, never ahead of Jesus. Because if our passion is ahead of Jesus, all it is is false commitments, false promises, empty words. Think about that now. Think about that when you're courting. Oh, I, I, I love this guy. He's buff. He's handsome. Or I love this woman. Man, she's, she's the gorgeous, beautiful, most beautiful thing in the world. I love passion. But if it's not lined up with Jesus, eventually it'll just become empty words, failed promises. That's all it'll be. Your passion for Christ, your passion needs to line up with Jesus Christ. Now Jesus, now in, in chapter 26, verses 69 through 75, Jesus has been arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. The disciples have scattered, just like Jesus said. <clears throat> and Peter is trying to be undercover. He's incognito, sitting outside the courtyard. And in verse 69, it says, <clears throat> Now Peter sat outside the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him, saying, you also were with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied it before them, all saying, I do not know what you are saying. Verse 71, and when he had gone out, 
to the gateway, another girl saw him and said to those who were there, this fellow also was with Jesus of, of Nazareth. But again, he denied with an oath. I do not know the man, in verse 73. And a little later, those who stood by came up and said to Peter, Surely you also are one of them, for your speech betrays you. Then he began to curse and swear, saying, I do not know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus, who had said to him, Before the rooster crows, <clears throat> You will deny me three times. So he went out and wept bitterly. <clears throat> A couple of points in here on why he wept so bitterly. The word bitterly means to, to be, to be cu a cutting, piercing pain. You might have experienced that with a, a loss of a loved one or, or something like that. But it's a cutting, piercing pain. Why was it so difficult for Peter. Well, number one, he denied the Lord by lying. I mean, he hung out with Jesus for almost three and a half years, and he lied that he didn't know him. Number two, he denied him with an oath. In other words, I promise I don't know him. And then he denied Jesus with a curse. Now, a curse is to pronounce a curse or death upon yourself by God if his words weren't true. Think about that. Think about you saying, you know what, God, if, if my words are not true, then strike me dead. That's what he was basically saying. And then he swore. And that's uh, affirming a promise. So all of these words that he said, all of these promises, and even God strike me dead if these words aren't true, and then denying Jesus, you can imagine how he felt. He lost it. He couldn't handle it. That's why we need to be careful with our words. In the multitude of words, sin is not lacking. We need to need our yes be yes and our no be no, and we don't need to go beyond that. But I think of Peter and, and just how he felt when he heard that rooster crow. It was not meant for him to carry all that. It was not meant for him to carry all those promises and all that. Again, if our passion does not line up with Jesus, there are empty words, failed promises that we can't keep. Jesus is going to restore Peter, though. Let's turn to John chapter 21. <clears throat> John chapter 21, the setting here is <laughs> Jesus is already resurrected from the dead. Uh, he's appeared to uh, the apostles, uh, and then uh, he appeared to them uh, when Doubting Thomas wasn't there, and he came and appeared again, and this time they're bored, and they're like, hey, let's, go, let's go fish. So they're out there fishing, and they see Jesus. They didn't know it was Jesus, but they saw Jesus on the shore. And Jesus is like, hey, throw the net on the other side. And they're like, we've been fishing all night, man. Okay, boom, they got a big catch. And then Peter's like, that's the Lord. Takes off the coat, jumps in the water, and goes to shore. And this is the setting here with the, with the seven of them. <clears throat> so when they had eaten breakfast, verse 15, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he uses the word agapeo, and it's a verb. And I think he's trying to bring out his, do you have a total commitment for me? Do you love me more than these? And he said to him, Peter, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. I phileo you. And that's a strong term for affection. I, I love you. I affectionately love you. But he couldn't respond with I don't, I can't give you that total commitment because remember, he denied Jesus three times. So he's being careful in what he's saying. So he is learning. He says, you, uh, he said to him, feed my lambs. The word feed there is bosco in the Greek and, it, and it's an imperative, it's a command and it means to teach God's word. So 
Jesus is telling Peter, feed, teach my sheep my word. Verse, 20, uh, verse 16, <clears throat> he said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he uses that same word, agapeo, do you have a total commitment for me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I affectionately love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. That word there is poimano, and it's an imperative a command, and it means to shepherd my sheep. In other words, lead, feed, and protect my sheep. And in verse 17, he said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? This time Jesus says, do you affectionately love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I affectionately love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. He goes back to teach my sheep my word. Three times Peter denies Jesus. Three times Jesus restores and commissions Peter. What can we take away from Peter's failure? Don't allow failures to keep you down. Learn from them. If not, they will cause huge distractions trying to move forward in life. Again, Use our failures as training ground to move on, not to continue to repeat them and repeat them. Proverbs 24, 16 says this, and it's in the New Living Translation. The godly may trip seven times, but they will get up again. But one disaster is enough to overthrow the wicked. Let me give you an example. My wife and I were going on 34 years of marriage. Now, praise the Lord, right? It hasn't been easy. It hasn't been easy for my wife because there was a lot of times where I was insensitive. And I remember the first year of my marriage, I had this, and dummy me, I had this little list of like all the things that she did wrong. And she didn't do this or she didn't do that. And, and then, you know, it's just like, and then one day the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and said, Leonard, I have forgiven you of so much. Why are you keeping tabs of Hoppy's wrongs? Oh, talk about a piercing and convicting. I knew it was a Holy Spirit moment, and I never I haven't done that since. Also, early on in my marriage, uh, I didn't value my wife like I should. Let me explain. So, during that first year of marriage, uh, my dad would, we'd, we'd go to my dad's house. He would, we'd carpool together. We worked at the same place. He would drop me off at, at his house and I would work out there because all the weights were there and stuff like that. And then I would jog home. It's about a four, mile, four or five mile jog. So I get home uh, from work around five o'clock. By the time I get done working out and jog home, it's like seven, seven thirty. And I'm doing this all week long. And then I'm tired, not really spending a lot of time with my wife. And now it's going into Saturday. And one Saturday, I'm in the garage and I'm working out. And I hear Hoppy's footsteps coming up the driveway. She comes inside the garage and I had to ask her this last night because she, she remembers what I wore the first date. Like, who remembers what you wore the first date? And this is what she said. She takes off her ring, her wedding ring, puts it on the workout bench, and she says this, quote, here you go, I never see you anyway. It seems like you're married to working out, unquote. And then she walked away. And I'm there like, And dummy me, finish out my workout. <laughs> Jog home because there was no car. And that was when the Lord began to say, you're failing on your marriage. 
you're failing on your marriage because you know why? Peter says to honor your wife. And that word there means to value. And think about this. For those of you who are married or thinking about getting married, especially you men, think about a shelf in your house. You have three shelves. Who's on the top shelf? Because if it's not your wife, she's going to know it. Your wife belongs on that top shelf. Not our working out, not our cars, not our sports. And then Hoppy was down on the second shelf. And it came out. She's like, here you go. You're married to that. Why do I say this? Because God wasn't done with me. He wasn't done with my marriage. I was willing to learn from my failures. And I thank God for my precious wife right here who has stuck it out. She's my best friend. There's no one I'd rather have in a foxhole in a war than my wife. And she has stuck it out through thick and thin. In closing, number one, don't allow hurtful or negative upbringings to cause us to live in fear or bondage. Fear and bondage are distractions. Number two, don't allow a previous sin or lifestyle to define who you are. Our identity is in Christ. Don't allow the past to distract you. Number three, don't allow failures, failures to keep you down. Learn from them. If not, they will become huge distractions in life. We need Jesus, not distractions. And I have one final quote. <clears throat> this is from Dr. David Jeremiah. <clears throat> and it's in reference to Jephthah, but it's just such a sweet quote. Quote, the rejection Jephthah experienced during times of peace prepared him to be a leader when war was threatening. Neither bad choices nor injustices done to a person must ever keep a child of God from completing God's calling, unquote. Amen? Let me pray. Father, I want to thank you for this time. I thank you for the word of God that's sharp and sharper and powerful than any two-edged sword. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would do the surgery in the hearts that needs to be done. I thank you, Lord. I pray for the rest of this conference. I pray for my young brothers and sisters, Lord, uh, that they would not allow their upbringing, a previous sin or lifestyle or failures to distract them from their calling that you've called them, Lord, to, and whatever that may be in life. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you and thank you.